What is neuroplasticity? Today, we'll look into your brain and see how it is physically changed by your behavior. We'll meet people who can see with their ears and we'll learn what plasticity can teach us about living a happier life. Let's go. Hey guys, Philip here, and today I want to talk about brains. But before we can think about neuroplasticity and what it does, we have to ask ourselves, what are brains actually for? What is their purpose, evolutionarily speaking? And you might think that's an easy question with super easy answers to find everywhere in any textbook, first, second page. That's not the case. It's quite the difficult question that neuroscientists have been asking themselves for centuries. Our best theory right now, and it might not be true, but it's pretty good, I think. It makes a lot of sense is originally brains and there weren't brains in the beginning, but just nerve cells, very simple nerve cells and nerve structures evolved for motion, for movement. That's one of the reasons why plants and trees don't have nerve cells. They don't have a need to move. They communicate in other ways. Modern brains, like our highly sophisticated ape brains, are so good in many more things than just motion and movement. They're highly adaptable. They can change and they can learn. Think about it for a second. If you're an animal, and you want to be extremely quick and adapting to your environment. Your genome is not the best place to code for that. Your DNA is too slow. It can't encode for all possible reactions you can have, for all possible scenarios or situations you might find yourself in as an individual or as an animal, right? You need something that can adapt quickly within seconds, not within generations. That's where the brain comes in. The brain is a quick adaptation machine. It allows you to react differently to different circumstances and not be hard-coded by the genome. So how does the brain accomplish this high adaptability and flexibility? The brain is made out of billions and billions of tiny nerve cells or brain cells. We call them neurons. And those neurons are talking to each other. They're connected to each other. Every single neuron is connected to about 10,000 other neurons in the brain. And those connections, they almost touch each other, but not quite, where they talk to each other with chemicals. We call them neurotransmitters. That's the synapse. And the synapse is really important because that's where information is very likely stored. What does it mean? I mean, in the synapses, in the strength and the configuration of different, of millions of synapses, is the information of your personality, of your sensations, of how you feel, of your emotions, of what you see, of what you remember. It's all in the synapse. What happens when you form a new memory? We thought a new neuron is grown. One new neuron for every new memory. But that's not the case. There's almost no new neuron growth in adulthood, in humans. So that can't be the case. So we discovered it's actually in the synapse strength where information is stored. So the synapses really matter. The synapses are the physical essence of who you are. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the molecular mechanism that makes the brain so adaptable. The most important principle in neuroscience is neurons that fire together, wire together. Now said differently, use it or lose it. So if two neurons are connected to each other through a synapse, and, there, when, and when the one neuron is activated, the other one also activates, then their synapse connection becomes stronger, making their connection bigger and stronger and more likely to activate the next time the same context happens, right? Reversely, if two neurons are connected to each other and they always fire at different times, they seem to be responsible for different things, so their connection will become weaker. And the next time something happens, they will probably not likely activate together. That's neuroplasticity in a nutshell. In other words, the things you do physically shape your brain. It changes your synapses. If you remember anything of this video, it will be because I managed to shape your brain. Neuroplasticity has other benefits. People suffering from brain damage or stroke, where a certain part of the brain becomes damaged or dies off, those functions within that specific area can sometimes be taken over by other brain areas that weren't originally designed to do that function. All right, let's talk about Batman. One of the coolest things ever showing the power of plasticity and the immense adaptability of our brains is human echolocation. It's blind people being able to see and navigate the world. They can walk through cities and bike on streets by nothing but listening to the environment. They have a click sound with their tongue. I can do it. And they can hear the reflections like sonar, like bats in the sky from objects. 
and can locate them in space. They see three-dimensional images. Let me say that again. Blind people can ride bikes by tipping the, by flipping the tongue and echolocating objects with their ears. Echolocation is actually very simple. The energy goes out from the individual. Uh, in our case, it's the for, in the form of a tongue click. Uh, and then that energy bounces off of everything in the environment, all surfaces everywhere, and comes back to the listener. I think that's the craziest thing ever. There's a structure here, a small one, or, well, it's a pole. Yeah. So, this would be a basketball court, and there would be the hoop. How cool is that? A big part of your brain is responsible for vision, for you seeing things. So, the part of the brain that does vision is in the back of your head. It's like the back part of your brain, ironically the farthest part away from your eyes. And that part usually activates when we see, when we have input, visual input. In people who are blind and who are echolocating and who are hearing things and trying to locate things, that part of the brain, that same part of the brain that's responsible for vision, activates during them clicking their tongues and seeing, quote unquote, with their ears. But there are limitations to this. We are most plastic during childhood. Makes sense, right? That when you are born, that's when you need to learn the most about an environment. You don't know the environment before you're born. With blind people who can echolocate with their ears, the younger they were when they became blind, the better they can echo echolocate. So the older you are, the older you are when you become blind and learn echolocating, the worse your accuracy is in this determining where exactly those objects are. So plasticity is powerful, but it's not infinitely powerful. And this is really important to remember. Think about it, otherwise a stroke, you know, having a stroke would be no big issue. Everybody would recover perfectly, which we don't do. A lot of people still struggle and almost never recover fully to their potential before they had a stroke. And not all regions can take over functions of other regions that were damaged. Some regions are highly specialized from birth and once they are destroyed or they die in an accident or in a stroke, no other part of the brain can take that function over and compensate for it. So there are limits to plasticity. That's really important to remember. On a more personal note, I think we can all learn something from plasticity. And the key message is plasticity happens whether you want to or not. What I mean is plasticity can be a very positive thing. If you learn a new skill or a language or you want to try to remember something, then it works in our favor. But at the same time, plasticity can work against us. In addiction, for instance, in drug use, the spiral, it becomes more difficult and difficult to quit because of plasticity and adaptation. At the same time, in PTSD, the traumatic event is re-experienced, literally relived every time you have a flashback, for instance, and creates a stronger and stronger emotional anxiety response, which lowers the threshold for your anxiety and nervousness throughout any life situation. Very anti-adaptive, actually. So how can you become a better person with the knowledge of neuroplasticity? I think if you're in a certain situation and you react with frustration or anger or hate or sadness, and you don't want to react that way because it makes you feel bad or you feel guilty afterwards, you have to be mindful of your initial reaction, of your ingrained response, and maybe take a step back and evaluate if that's who you want to be. Because every time you react that way, those connections will become stronger and it will become more likely that the next time you react the same way. So if you want to avoid that, you have to be mindful and take a mindful step, which in the beginning might require a little bit more effort to change your behavior, to change your reaction to a situation. But with every time you change it and every time you decide it to react differently, those connections will be stronger as well. So with a little effort and understanding, you might be able to change yourself for the better, one synapse at a time. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel either here on the left or below on the subscribe button. Easy to find in every first first page of every fucking... I can't say that. And we learn what puts it.